Okay, all good, Balaji. Okay. So, good evening, everybody. It's uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor V. Kumar Murthy from the University of Toronto. Uh, he is, I mean, everybody knows about him in India. It's, he and his brother have been, I think, uh, at, at the missionary seal, talking about mathematics all over India. So everybody knows about him here. But it's, I should still, I have the pleasure of introducing him in a formal way today. Uh, Kumar Murthy is right now the, the director of the Fields Institute, and he's uh, known for his fundamental work on uh, the non-vanishing of L functions, along with his brother uh, Ram Murthy, for which he was given the Belagur Prize. He was elected the fellow of uh, the Royal Society of Canada in 1995 and is also the fellow of the American Mathematical Society. He was elected in 2021. He's received several prizes. He's been the chair of the, the, the Department of Mathematics in Toronto for at least uh, 10 years that I know of. And so it's a, it's, a, it's a special pleasure for me to have him give the first math talk here in this session. And he's gonna talk about something rather transcendental the title is Zeta 3, log 2, and pi. Kumar Murthy. Okay, thanks, thanks, Balaji. Thanks for the introduction, and thanks to the organizers for the uh, invitation to participate in this. Let me see, I'm going to try sharing screen. Hopefully, it works like it did before. And we have to find the talk here. Okay, can you see that? Yeah. And, yeah, it's fine. Uh, and do I need to make it as full screen, or is this okay as it is? Can you see that? Uh, okay, I'll, I think I'll keep it like this because if I do full screen, sometimes the thing has a tendency to crash. Good. Okay, yeah. good. Okay. Good. Good. okay. So um, again, thanks for the uh, invitation to speak here. I thought I'd start off because it's a sort of a important occasion, what you guys are doing. You're starting this brand new center. So I thought first, before jumping into the math, I want to make some general reflections. And if, um, by the way, that noise that keeps coming every now and then is my email. And email, uh, <laughs> more than one, you probably know what director's emails sound like. <laughs> it's going to be constant. Unfortunately, I, can't, I don't seem to be able to turn it off. So I uh, just bear with me on that. Uh, I thought I'd start off with uh, five sort of general reflections. And I put them here right at the front, partly because, as I said, um, this is an important occasion, what you guys are, are embarking on, starting up this new center. And I think it deserves uh, some reflection on its own. Uh, and then the other reason for having these things is in case you get bored of the talk early on, as soon as I get into the math, uh, just keep, take note of these five points and think about them for the rest of the hour and you'll be fine. <laughs> so first thing I wanted to say is about uh, uh, Coley himself. He was, as I understand, uh, the founder of the Tata Consultancy Services. Now, Tata Consultancy Services is interesting. It's a software entity. It offers software services. But the point is that uh, this is a major shift in, we don't think of it like that now, but when it happened, it's a major shift in the world when the uh, assets are moving from the tangible to the intangible, from, from uh, the physical to uh, the knowledge, knowledge assets. And when we think of uh, prosperity and wealth and well-being, uh, we have to understand the world is constantly going, undergoing changes in the way we, we see that. And being able to understand those changes as they occur and to tap into them is, is quite important if we expect to have any kind of path to prosperity. What happened that many years ago when, when software services became a, a, a dominant force in the world as far as wealth creation is concerned, it's still happening. And so we have to pay attention to the way uh, the world is changing and uh, what the implications that has to what we do and how we do it and what, in, what, uh, what role we play in the bigger picture. The second point I want to make is about pure versus applied research. When, when um, Balaji and Madan first contacted me about uh, giving a talk here, I thought because this is the Kohli Center, I'm supposed to give a talk in applied mathematics. <laughs> uh, uh, but but they, they quickly told me that, no, no, you can speak about uh, whatever you like. And so I, I, I chose uh, something closer to my heart about in, uh, in pure mathematics. But I want to say that um, 
we really shouldn't make such a hard and fast distinction between pure and applied research. And uh, if we look back at our great heroes and great mathematicians of the past, such as Euler, Euler is a name that's going to appear several times in today's discussion. Uh, they didn't consider themselves either pure mathematicians or applied mathematicians. They just considered themselves as mathematicians. Um, and so it's, it's important from, from, the, from a young age to sort of keep this in mind. Don't make a, such a distinction between pure and applied research. It's just too interesting math, wherever, wherever it leads us. The third thing is that sometimes we undersell ourselves. We in mathematics, uh, we think that uh, what we do, we don't understand the value of it. In fact, mathematics is the most disruptive technology there is. Uh, there is not a single advance in modern technology that hasn't been driven in a fundamental way by mathematics. Um, and uh, so that's something to keep in mind, uh, not only when you engage in your own activity, but you're communicating what you do to others. And that we haven't seen the end of it, it's going to continue to be disruptive. At the Fields Institute, we're trying to take advantage of this by a new initiative called MAGIC. MAGIC is an acronym standing for Mathematics and the Global Impact Center. And what we're trying to do there is take a, um, seven hard problems that will really impact the world if there's any, any progress in them, in which we feel mathematics can play a significant role. And magic is built around those seven pillars. And I've listed three of them here. One is diabetes, uh, one is language of the brain, and the third is smart villages. Um, so these are, uh, uh, each one of these I can talk for a long time about, but, but the point is in each of these, there is a significant contribution for mathematics um, to advance the, uh, the uh, solutions of these problems. And it's not, it's not uh, when we say mathematics, sometimes out, people outside the field think, Oh, is it computation? Uh, or is it some, some kind of uh, um, data analysis? Could be machine learning? No, 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 I mean fundamental mathematics. I mean, um, uh, what, what uh, in other contexts you might consider really hardcore or pure mathematics actually has a role to play in, in all of these. And we are engaged in that research. The final thing I want to talk about, or mention is the power of imagination. So when we think of our world, the world we see, uh, outside and our own inner world, the world of ideas, don't underestimate the power of imagination. If we're going, we're all dreamers, all of us are dreamers. Uh, so if we're going to dream, then let's dream big dreams. Um, I, I give you a quote from uh, Harishchandra, a very, very solid um, um, leading mathematician, uh, who almost single handedly developed the representation theory of symbols into Lee groups. I have pondered over the roles of knowledge or experience on the one hand and imagination or intuition on the other in the process of discovery. I believe that there is a certain fundamental conflict between the two and knowledge by advocating caution tends to inhibit the flight of imagination. Therefore, a certain naivety unburdened by conventional wisdom can sometimes be a positive asset. Now, of course, in mathematics, when we say we have a proof, we better have a proof. I mean, there is a certain uh, uh, requirements of rigor and uh, accuracy and correctness. But the point is, but you don't write down the final proof from the get-go. How do you go from idea to, to innovation to the discovery, and then which finally manifests as a proof? There, there's a, a big, role for the play of imagination. And if we don't allow imagination to flourish and have its play uh, in the beginning, then uh, I think our theorems will be kind of um, um, correspondingly diminished in their um, impact and significance. Uh, I quote Harishchandra and I mentioned Euler before. Euler was a real dreamer. He was a real dreamer, meaning he, he, um, he thought of uh, big ideas, and he didn't mind making a mistake. So he would often say things, or, or write, and say maybe he said them, but we, we have his writing. Uh, he would write things that were, would be false, or, or there'd be a gap in the way he's, he wrote it, but then he'd just fix it and, and move on. So there's something to be said for allowing the imagination to, uh, to have a free reign, at least for a while, to dream big dreams of what may be possible. Question is, 
does the should the outside world or the apparent reality of the outside world shape our thinking, or should we allow our thinking to shape the outside world? I of course believe that the latter. That do we consider reality shaped by our thought? So there are three important numbers for number theorists. You know, uh, these are really beautiful numbers: zeta of three, log two, and pi. And um, they're connected. So I want to describe some uh, work that I've been doing on mixed motives with uh, my former student and current postdoc, Payman Eskandari. And some of it is abstract, but it's rooted in really fundamental questions that, that you can ask, that uh, we, do, we do ask ourselves even when we're quite young. Um, and they are still enigmatic, but, but it's just amazing how um, how much of mathematics is, in, is intertwined in trying to understand these kind of numbers. So what can we ask about zeta of three? I'll define it. Many of you know it. It's the value of the Riemann zeta function at three. I'll, I'll, I'll say a little bit explicitly what it is in case you're not familiar with it. But what can we ask about these numbers? You can ask, are they rational numbers? You know, some, if, uh, you ask, what does a number theorist do? Oh, you study numbers one, two, three. They're, no, I'm studying numbers that aren't, <laughs> that aren't even fractions. <laughs> they can't, they're not even roots of equations, polynomial equations. So we ask questions about irrationality, the transcendence, the algebraic independence. And usually you ask these about numbers that somehow arise in nature. See, pi you can think of as arising in nature. I mean, you, you draw uh, a unit circle and um, um, uh, the measure the, the circumference and you get pi or you measure the area, pi will be involved in it. So pi somehow arises geometrically and you ask what kind of number is it? Uh, logs of, of uh, algebraic number of integers also arise in some way. Zeta maybe is, is less obvious why it would arise. But we think of it, at least in number theory, we think of it as a very quite a natural number, um, uh, quite a natural quantity to study. Um, and, um, and so we ask these questions about irrationality and transcendence. But as I said, these are actually hard questions. And the, the modern reinterpretation of these questions is to frame them in terms of periods of motives and mixed motives. And I'm going to tell you what, what all those words mean in a minute. But there's a principle going on here um, that in the absence of an algebra geometric constraint, periods should be transcendental or even algebraically independent. That means if, they, if you take two numbers which are, period, which are designated as periods and there's any kind of algebraic dependency relationship between them, that should translate into some sort of algebra geometric statement. That's the, that's the kind of principle that's behind it. And, and really that's, that's what's behind uh, period, the so-called period conjecture of Grothendieck. Grothendieck is another dreamer, by the way. I mentioned Euler. Grothendieck also dreamed big. And you know, some people don't, many, maybe many don't think of Grothendieck as a dreamer because he's wrote down a lot of hard theorems. But, but actually, I'm just, uh, one is just flattened by how, how vast his, um, is dreaming goals in terms of trying to piece together um, uh, uh, the, this new way of looking at things. And uh, in the midst of that, one, across, one comes across this so-called period conjecture. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about periods. So notice by the, the title, uh, I call it zeta three log two and pi. So neither periods, uh, periods don't appear here. So uh, neither do motives, but we will see why, how both of those enter. Okay, so period. So naively, a period is the result of integrating a differential form along the cycle. So for example, if you integrate bz by z on the unit circle, you get two pi i. So two pi i might be considered a period. And if you strip it of the algebraic part, then you think of pi is essentially a period. There's a nice uh, paper by Konsevich and Zagye, who well, it's called periods, uh, where they develop the following point of view to try to say, what is the most general kind of uh, number that you can call a period. And so here's how they define it. Uh, you integrate a rational function. So f over g, where f and g are uh, polynomials in n variables with algebraic coefficients. And you integrate it on a semi-algebraic set in Rn. 
And that the value of that is called a period. That's what they say. So for example, log two is the integral of dx over x on this semi-algebraic set, so x between one and two. Pi is the area of the circle, unit circle. Again, an integral of dx dy on that semi-algebraic set. So pi and log two in the concept which I gave sense are periods because of this. Now we can make more periods. Uh, in particular, we can talk about iterated integrals. Now iterated integrals is something you see in calculus, but, but now in the modern context, it, it appears in Chen's theory of periods of mixed motives. So an iterated integral is I have a pair of functions and I, I integrate f from a to t and then uh, integrate g of t, where t now goes from a to b, that's an iterated integral. And it turns out now I can write, uh, if I consider this integral, which is an iterated integral, uh, its value is this number zeta of three, which I, I'm sorry, I've not defined yet, but uh, um, I will a little later. Okay, so zeta of three is also period in the conservative Zagier sense. So pi log two and zeta of three are periods, but they, they've arisen in different contexts and, and there's, it's not clear there's any geometry in the way we've written them as periods. What we're going to do by the end of the talk is to consider a single object. And in some sense, it is geometric. Uh, you, you may shrug your shoulders at the end to see when I say what it is, but it is geometric. Uh, we're going to consider a single object that carries all of these three as periods. Okay, and for that, we're going to have to develop a more conceptual point of view. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about transcendence. So transcendental number theory is a part of number theory that produces, uh, that studies the question of algebraicity and transcendence of certain um, numbers that arise either uh, um, as sums of series or as uh, something arising from a differential equation, special values of, L func of, of, of functions. Um, so in, uh, Amongst the many success stories, amongst the few rather success stories in transcendental number theory is the theorem of Lindemann and Weierstrass about the um, values of the exponential function. So if I take uh, a bunch of distinct algebraic numbers, alpha one to alpha k, then e to the alpha one to e to the alpha k are q bar linearly independent. In other words, there is no um, linear relation between them uh, with algebraic coefficients. In particular, each one of these is transcendental. But here's a curious consequence of this coming from the functional equation of the exponential function, namely that e to the x plus y is e to the x times e to the y. Using that, you can actually strengthen this theorem from linear independence to algebraic independence. Namely, so the consequence is if alpha one to alpha q are rational numbers and q linearly independent, then e to the alpha one, e to the alpha k are algebraically independent. So that's the apparent strengthening of the Lindemann virus was from linear independence to algebraic independence. And the reason it happens is because of the functional equation, e to the x plus y is e to the x times e to the y. Because you see, suppose you had a algebraic dependence, uh, so some polynomial in these, uh, e to the alpha one to e to the alpha k coming out to zero with algebraic coefficients, then um, because of the functional equation, what it means is that two of those monomials must have the same exponent. Because by the Lindemann virus theorem, if I had distinct algebraic numbers, then each of these monomials should be q-bar linearly independent. But the, the fact that they're algebraically dependent means they've got a bunch of mono, monomials in e to the alpha one to e to the alpha k, who are, which are q-bar linearly dependent. So two of those uh, monomials must be the same, but then that produces a, a linear dependence between the uh, alpha i's and contradicting the hypothesis that they're q linearly independent. Okay, so that's a really curious thing that the, this linear independent statement can be strengthened to algebraic independence. And there's a more general conjecture of Chanuel that if I took not just algebraic alphas, but, but complex alphas, which are um, Q linearly independent, then the transcendence degree generated by the alphas and the values of the exponential function is at least N. So notice by the way, if, if the alphas are algebraic, then we, we have this by what I just said. 
So the problem is what happens when the alphas are not um, algebraic. Uh, but, but a consequence of this, by the way, is if I took for these alphas logs of integers, if I took for the alphas logs of integers, then some of the exponential are all, um, uh, exponential is are odd integers, they're algebraic. So therefore, Chanuel would say that these are algebraically independent if they are culinarily independent. And for logs of integers to be culinarily independent means that there is no multiplicative relation between the MI. So for example, if these are distinct primes, then you'd expect uh, the logs of distinct primes to be algebraically independent according to Chanuel's conjecture. Baker's theorem gives that they're Q-bar linearly independent. So we have linear independence, but not algebraic independence. So here's a perspective that many of the numbers we've been successful in proving transcendence results for have an interpretation as periods. So I spoke to you about two different things. First, we, we, we talked a little bit about uh, periods, and then we talked about transcendence. And, and there's a perspective here that the numbers that we've been successful in proving are transcendental tend to have an interpretation as periods. But there are some numbers that we do know are transcendental and which we don't have a period uh, representation as a period. And there are other numbers that we, we can't even prove they're irrational and we have no clue what these numbers are. So let me talk about two of these numbers, especially one particularly enigmatic one, little gamma. So little gamma is something you we see in high school. It's uh, if you take the harmonic series, summation one over n and less than equal to x, and uh, you know that it behaves like log x, subtract log x and take the limit as x tends to infinity, that's a constant and that's little gamma. It's about 0.5 something. Um, we don't even know whether this number is irrational. Now, here is an interesting point about this gamma, because I just said here, our attempt at proving transcendence results um, seems to depend on interpreting numbers as periods. And we don't have an interpretation of gamma as a period, but gamma seems to be a new kind of object. It seems to be, it seems to be the log of a period. So let me explain this because this is still an area of active research now. Suppose I take a number field that is a, a finite extension of the rational numbers. Then I, I have, well, I didn't even define the Riemann zeta function, but, but assuming you know what that is, there's a, there's a version of the zeta function for this number field called the Dedekind zeta function. And the Dedekind zeta function, like the Riemann zeta function, has a simple pole at s equals one. And so if you take the logarithmic derivative, near s equals one, then it'll be a, have a simple pole with residue minus one. That's the nice thing about taking logarithmic derivative of a, of a meromorphic function. The residue is just the order. And the constant is what's the constant term in the Laurent expansion at s equals one is called gamma sub k. So if k is q, this is Euler's gamma. This gamma was studied by Euler. So this is Euler's gamma. Okay. Now, if, if, if I have a Galois extension, then the Dedekind zeta function, this Dedekind zeta function can be factored in terms of art and L functions corresponding to the Galois group of K over Q, corresponding to representations of the Galois group of K over Q. And using that, then you, you can write this, this uh, Euler constant gamma K, which was introduced, which was systematically studied by Ihara, and he, which he calls the euler kronecker constant. You can write it as little gamma plus a linear combination of logarithmic derivatives of art and L functions evaluated at one. I'm not going to define these, you're not going to use these, but, but just say there are, there are objects, uh, very beautiful deep arithmetic objects, art and L functions, and their logarithmic derivatives at one somehow um, form a linear combination to give rise to this Euler Kronecker constant. Now, here's the amazing conjecture, which is still open. I call it the Kolmes Yoshida conjecture, although the, the, both Kolmes and Yoshida made it at different times in different forms. What they say is that something very, very closely related to gamma k, which I call gamma k tilde minus, has the property that when you exponentiate it, you get a power of pi and you get something else raised to the degree. Uh, and this applies for CM fields K. 
Okay, CM field means it's a totally complex quadratic uh, extension of a totally real field. And what is this P sub K11? It is a virtual period. It's made up out of, it's a monomial in periods of abelian varieties with complex multiplication by K. Okay, so whatever it is, it arises from geometry. This thing arises from geometry, but not a clean geometric. It's not a period in the classical sense. Here's a differential form on a variety and you integrate it on a cycle. It's virtual. So already you see the motive sort of peeking, peeking in here. It's virtual. And what's fascinating about this, by the way, in the case that K is an imaginary quadratic field, this is the chawla selberg formula which evaluates the period of an elliptic curve in terms of values of the gamma function. So Kolmes Yoshida conjecture is a big generalization of the chawla selberg formula, and it involves this mysterious gamma, and it and involves periods of abelian varieties with complex multiplication. Now, what's weird about this is gamma and gamma k arose from a dedicant zeta function, which you might think of as motives of weight zero. And it's appearing, supposed to appear in a formula involving motives of weight one. So there's something really strange going on here if, uh, if we are able, ever able to prove this, that um, you're getting periods of motives with different weight sort of hanging in together. Okay, this gamma appears again. People have been trying to figure out what gamma is for a long time. There's now a theory of exponential periods of Josen and Fresen. and it might be out by now. Um, also worth looking at where you just define a new class of motives, um, which are called exponential motives. Okay, now let's go to the zeta function. I've already alluded to the zeta function a couple of times, but let's go back to that. So this sum, if I sum the reciprocals of the integers, one over n squared, I get pi squared over six. Now, this is something we hear about quite early in our careers, most of us. But at the time of Euler, this was a big problem. This was a, many people were trying to figure out what is this sum. And Euler came up with a proof of this and he came up with uh, not only a proof of this one, but if I replace the n squared by n to any even power, let's call that zeta of two n, that it's a rational multiple of pi to the two n. So n equals one is here. By the way, if you want to see a really simple and elegant proof of this, I refer you to a paper of Ram that appeared in the math student. Um, it's only a couple of pages long and it's really beautiful. Um, and you'll see um, um, how this is proved and also how this is, this is reduced as a consequence of that. So this was a problem at Euler's time and he solved it. And then you, people naturally ask, what happens if I replace the two with a three? Just like I asked here, if I replace two with a four, what if I replace the two with a three or a five or a seven? And you think, well, two, three, what's the difference? Just add one. <laughs> this is what, if you can do one, you should be able to do the other. No. Euler tried. Many people have tried, and we still don't know how to do it. We don't know what zeta of three is. But in 1740, I told you, started off by saying Euler was a, a dreamer. He knew how to dream big. 1740, he writes a paper where he tries to compute zeta at some odd values. And he comes to a curious statement that, I mean, to be fair to him, he didn't say he's a conjecture. He's asking, is zeta of an odd power, or an odd number divided by that power of pi, a rational function of log two? Why he chose log two, I, I'm not clear on still. But he's asking that a part, so here you have a clean thing as a rational multiple of pi to the two n, is zeta of three expressible algebraically in terms of pi cubed and log two? or in other words, as expressible algebraically in terms of pi and log two. In other words, are zeta of three pi and log two algebraically dependent? 
And the point of the talk today, or the, the result we have with Payman, is to show that that question is inconsistent with growth in the X period conjecture. So we're, as I said, we're going to show you that they construct a motive, a mixed motive, in fact, that has these three numbers, and in fact, the fourth number also as periods, and whose Mumford-Tate group is large. And by growth in the period conjecture would therefore imply that those numbers are all algebraically independent. Okay, so now to do this, I'm going to have to shift our perspective a little bit to motives and mixed motives. So what is a motive? Uh, I'm, I'm not going to be, I'm going to be informal in this, in this talk. Um, it's a piece of cohomology of a smooth projective variety. So you have, you have a smooth projective variety. It has all sorts of cohomologies. It has Betty cohomology, it has Durham cohomology, et al cohomology. A motive is somehow a piece of that cohomology. So you can't ascribe it to a geometric object, but it seems to have all the same structure. It has a Betty structure, it has a Durham structure, it has a Etal structure, it has compatibility maps between the two. And um, it lives on its own. I mean, it's, not a, it's not constructed geometrically, but necessarily, but it, it, uh, it has all this structure. So if I start out with a smooth projective variety, then of course I have all these different cohomologies, um, uh, a Betty cohomology, a Durham cohomology, uh, I said here K vector space, this, this is Q. It's a, I'm thinking of X over Q. I have a Q vector space of the Durham cohomology. I have a Q vector space coming from Betty cohomology or singular cohomology. And then I have et al or elliptic cohomology. So for every prime L, I have some QL vector space. And there are comparison maps between these. Here's a comparison map between Betty and Durham. So over the complex numbers is an isomorphism. So which means that these two are, are lattices underlying the same complex vector space. Now, from this point of view, a period is what measures the difference between those lattices. So, uh, uh, the two cohomologies give different rational structures of the same underlying C vector space and comparing the two bases gives periods. In other words, if you integrate um, a, or if you pair um, a basis vector here with a basis vector here, uh, then what you get is a period. Okay, that's, that's in the pure sense, but then you can also go into the mixed sense. Let me give you, go back to a classical example before jumping into mixed motives. Let's look at where these come from in a very natural way. Suppose I take a modular curve, uh, which is the upper half plane modulo some congruent subgroup of, of SL2Z, in particular gamma naught FM. I'm, not, I'm going, going to define things precisely here, but you don't need to know the precise definitions, just, you know, you most, most of you have heard of these, these, uh, these objects. Gamma naught N is a particular congruent subgroup of, of um, SL2Z. Uh, and because uh, when, you, when you take this quotient, there's a natural action, it acts by fraction linear transformation. When you, act, when you take the quotient, you get an open Riemann surface, which you can compactify by, by adding a finite number of cusps. Namely, you extend this action of this is up, this script H is the upper half plane. You extend the action to the boundary, which is uh, P1 of uh, R. And again, you get a finite number of orbits for that, and those are called the cusps. And when you add them, you get a compact Riemann surface whose complex points is this. Now, what's in, important is that, uh, of course, comp compact Riemann surfaces are algebraic curves, but this one has a model defined over Q. This is a curve defined over Q. And now when you take its Jacobian, you get an abelian variety. And this is not any old abelian variety. It has a huge um, bunch of correspondences acting on it, namely the so-called HECA operators. Okay, they're defined in a very natural way. Whatever it is, there's a big algebra of correspondences operating on this, on the curve, and therefore they become endomorphisms of the Jacobian. And if you, if you restrict to the so-called new part, then this algebra is commutative and semi-simple. So it's a product that fields and that decomposes the Jacobian into these um, quotients, AIs. And these quotients are, are in general associated to 
certain cusp forms of wave two. Okay. Now, in the case that in the case that um, this modular form that is here, which is uh, like if you like, it's a, a, um, some, a function which is giving rise to a differential form of weight two here, uh, of, of, sorry, of, one, of one form on this, on this Riemann surface, f of z dz. Um, and if, uh, yeah, and such an, such an f for a function to give rise to a, a, um, a form on this quotient, it has to transform in a particular way according to the action of gamma naught, and that gives rise to modular forms. And these modular forms um, have a period, have a, a Fourier expansion because the uniformizer at infinity is given by e to the two pi i z. And when you expand that that uh, modular form and look at the Fourier coefficients, they turn out to be algebraic, and they live in a number field. By the way, I, I can't help but uh, comment that the first person, as far as I know, to understand that the Fourier coefficients of modular forms are are of great importance in number theory is Ramanujan. So these, uh, these uh, Fourier coefficients generate a certain number field and this abelian variety has endomorphisms by that number field and its dimension is given by the degree of the number field. In particular, if the, if the form has rational coefficients, this gives an elliptic curve. And this is Taniyama's conjecture that every elliptic curve arises in this way. Taniyama conjecture that was settled by Wiles and then in, essentially, and then by, uh, completed by a few others, essentially says that every uh, elliptic curve arises as one of these A's of F's corresponding to an F with rational integer coefficients. Now, when you have an abelian variety, you can consider points of L power order on that uh, torsion points, uh, which are killed by a power of a prime. And that gives rise to something called the Tate module. And there's a natural action of the Galois group on this Tate module. Okay. And um, this is for this is how you get um, Galois representations associated to modular forms of weight two. And if you want to work with modular forms of higher weight, then you need to use something called Sato varieties. I think since I'm going a little slower than I expected, maybe I'll just speed up a little bit. And um, um, so the reason I was trying to tell you about Sato varieties is that. I want to, I've constructed here geometrically in the case of weight two forms, a Galois representation. And when I want such representations for higher weight, I don't have a natural geometric object. I need to go to a motive. And you get it from a piece of the cohomology of the Sato variety. And it turns out these representations hold the key to our understanding of the arithmetic properties of Fourier coefficients for cusp forms of positive weight, but they also uh, apply to more, even more classical problems where it's questions about partitions. But, but the important thing is the connection between all of that starts with this Galois representation. And now we, we, if you ask, what is the image or the, uh, of this Galois representation, the risky closure of that image of that map, then it turns out in the case that, um, the first case that I considered, namely where F corresponds to an elliptic curve, the image is either GL2, or if, if the curve doesn't have complex multiplication, or the restriction of scalars of a one-dimensional term GM over K, if it has complex multiplication by K. So in a, whatever it is, this Galois representation picks up a certain group, G sub F. Now, it turns out that, that uh, the image of the Galois representation then it turns out is the, is the QL points of G sub F, at least for L large. Okay, so what have we found? We found an algebraic loop group defined over F independent of L for which the image of Galois for each of these elliptic representations is the QL points of GF. This G sub F is sort of, we think of now as a motivic uh, Galois group. So usually what you, you make this more generally in a Tanakian category, and it's the associated group, but that every object in the Tanakian category is a representation of that group. For example, if you took the category of hard structures or even mixed hard structures, it is the Mumford-Tate group. Okay. So in this context, then Grothendieck's conjecture says the following, that the dimension of this motivic Galois group gives the transcendence degree of the field generated by the periods. 
Okay, that's the growth in the period conjecture in this general. So if I go back to the case of elliptic curves, we have our motivic Galois group G sub F was uh, either GL2 in the non-CM case, so that's four dimensional, or restriction of scalars from an imaginary quadratic field of a one dimensional torus. So that's a two dimensional torus. So the dimension of this group in the case of an elliptic curve is either two or four. So his conjecture, growth index conjecture predicts that the transcendence degree of the field generated by the period is either two or four, depending on whether the curve has complex multiplication or non-complex multiplication. All we know, this conjecture is still open. In the case of an elliptic curve, it's still open. And all we know by work of Chudnowski is that it's at least two. <laughs> So there's no, at least it's inconsistent for that. I can apply growth index conjecture in an even simpler example than, than an elliptic curve. I can take H2 of P1. This gives rise to something called the Tate motive, denoted Q of minus one. It's a one dimensional motive. If I look at what is the Galois representation associated to this, the action of Galois Q bar over Q on L power roots of unity. That's what the Tate model, that's what torsion points on GM are. And so the Galva group, the image of Galva is, um, is, is, is given by the QL points of GM. So the motivic Galva group here is one dimensional. So it says the transcendence degree of the field generated by the period should be one dimensional. Well, what's the period associated to this? It's pi. So in this case, growth index conjecture says that pi is transcendental, mm -hmm. which we know is true. Okay, so now let me talk a little bit about the mixed case. So that was pure, pure motive. Let me talk a little bit about the mixed case. Again, go back to the, this uh, algebraic curve, um, X naught of N. Now, there's a theorem of Manin and Rinfeld that tells us that, so remember what, how we got it, we, we had this open Riemann service, then we adjoined the finite number of points at the cusps that came from the boundary. But now it turns out this construction is rational and these cusps are actually defined um, some, uh, in some cases anyway, they're defined over Q. At least the, the, the divisor class, the class group generated by the cups is defined over Q. And there's a theorem of Manin and Rinfeld that says that the group they generate inside the Jacobian is torsion. Okay, so these are a bunch of points that, that you constructed by hand. Now inside the Jacobian, which is, what, what is it formally? It's divisors of degree zero modulo rational equivalent. So, so these divisors of degree zero are, are generating some group and Mann and Rinfeld tells us that this group is torsion. Now, the question we ask is, suppose I take a, not this curve, but a smooth projective curve of some genus, positive genus and a finite set of points. What can you say about the rank of the subgroup generated by those points in the Jacobian? Okay, so in general, of course, that's too, that's too general a question. So uh, it's harder to, uh, hard to exactly analyze, but I want to tell you that that has, a, that has an interpretation. This answer to this question has an interpretation in terms of the motivic Galois group. So here's the sequence that if I look at the punctured curve, um, I can um, make a map uh, from the inclusion of the punctured curve in the full curve, I get a map from H1 of X to H1 of the inclusion of H1 of the complete curve. And then I have a map to a, a number of copies of, of um, um, what I, again, this Q of minus one given by residues. If I take a, C, a pay basis here of um, um, differentials that have rational residues. And then the, this sequence we find is split uh, as kind of observation of delay. And I believe in the arcade, in the Corvallis volumes uh, that this sequence is split if and only if the, the, uh, the group generated by S is torsion in the Jacobian. So this is how we, it's interpreted in. So therefore, Mann and Rinfeld interpretation then is that the sequence should split in the case of the modular curve and, and the S is a set of cusps. Uh, here's a reinterpretation that uh, this the sequence gives you a mixed hard structure on H1X, the punctured curve. Here's a, here's a pure hard structure of H1. Here's a pure hard structure of A2. And so this mixed hard structure gives rise to an associated Mumford Tate group. That group is not reductive, it has a unipotent radical. And a theorem I proved with Tame some time ago is this that the unipotent radical 
of the Montfortate group of that punctured curve is 2G times the rank of the subgroup generated by S. So this uh, is an the, interpretation. The unipotence yeah. comes because it's a mixed uh, hot structure, not a pure yeah, exactly. hot structure. Exactly, 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 exactly. So the, the, the unipotent radical has an interpretation here as the rank of the, uh, up to this multiple 2G, the rank of the subgroup generated by S. So in the case of the modular curve and S being the set of cusp, when Manin Jinshal tells you that the, uh, this, this rank is zero, it means the sequence splits, that the unipotent radical is zero. Okay, but you can prove that directly too. So, so the unipotent radical, the montfort group or mixed hard structure has an arithmetic meaning. So more generally now, uh, I'm going to explain about mixed hard structures, but I think uh, I'm supposed to end in about 10 minutes. Is that right? So uh, you're muted, Balti. You, you, you can take a little bit more, I said. I mean, oh, if you have okay. five, six minutes. <laughs> well, let's see. Yeah, okay. So I think uh, I better uh, speed up a little bit because I want to get to the punchline and I'm only in halfway in the talk. So, so more generally, you see, you can construct just as this was a mixed uh, hard structure, you can look at uh, more general mixed hard structures and you get a Mumford-Tate group, you get a Tanakian category and a Mumford-Tate group to it. Um, and we can look at, here's the general period conjecture that the transcendence to be of the field generated by the periods of that mixed hard structure should be uh, the dimension of the Mumford-Tate group. And our point is that the Mumford-Tate group in general is hard to get your hands on, but the unipotent radical is uh, somewhat more accessible. Okay, I see there's something in the chat. If you don't mind, I'll address the chat at the end so that I, I uh, try to finish. Okay. So we're going to use the unipotent radical to, to get some information also about periods. Okay, now zeta function as a period. Now it becomes a little bit more abstract. Uh, <clears throat> Borel and Wojewodski showed that there's a, a non-trivial extension of Tate motives. Um, whenever I have an uh, odd integer n, um, this, this is a Tate motive of weight minus two n, and that there's a non-trivial extension of this, and the periods of that, that mixed motive have been computed by Dillon and Gonkarov uh, as essentially a power of pi, in fact, pi to the n, and pi to the n times zeta of n. And the Galois group, the motivic Galois group associated to this sort of looks like a Kummer uh, extension. It's two dimensional, it looks like that. And so the, the growth and the conjecture in this case predicts that the transcendence degree of the periods is two. In other words, the zeta of n for n odd at least three and pi are algebraically independent. So that's the prediction of the, of the growth and the conjecture there. Okay, now more generally, <clears throat> if I take, um, um, how, I just want to say a few words about how we studied the unipotent radical. Um, so I have this, um, some sort of Tanakian category with the weight filter, weight filter. Think, think of mixed hot structures just to be very explicit. And I take an object, then I can look also inside um, the category generated by the graded object for each, I take the graded uh, according to the weight filtration object of each object here and um, take the tensor subcategory generated by that. And the unipotent um, radical is essentially the kernel of the image of the, the quotient map of the motivic Galva group of M to the motivic Galva group of the graded object. And little u of M is the Lie, Lie algebra of that object. And it is in fact an object in the, in the category because the Galois group, the, uh, the motivic Galois group acts on it through the um, uh, adjoint representation. Since objects, representations of the Galois group are objects of the category, this is actually an object in the category. And then noticing what, how um, this thing does, it actually decreases weight and therefore you see that it lies in the minus one part of the weight filtration of the endomorphism um, algebra of M. Okay, so now we're going, to, we're going to say that the unipotent radical is large when you have equality here. Okay, and we're going to look at motives where the unipotent radical is large. 
there's a connection to extensions, uh, namely for the, at each prime, at, uh, prime, sorry, whenever I see P, I'm sorry, I'm a number theorist. Whenever I see P, I think of primes, but here P is not a prime. P is any, P is any uh, integer. Uh, we have uh, um, this weight filtration. I take the P, P level of the weight filtration and the quotient is, is M mod WPM. Um, so I have such an extension for each P and I call that E sub P of M. And I can fit all of these extensions. I can add them up and make them live inside um, X to one, W minus one and M. And there's a theorem of Dillon that says that uh, the characterizes the unipotent radical or at least it's Lie algebra in terms of this, these extension, this extension data. Okay, let me not be too precise here. Um, we actually go a little bit further and study each of the individual ones rather than just the sum. Um, and we get some, some statement about uh, when we can make us uh, analogous to what, what Dillon did about the full, the, the sum of the E sub P's. We make some statement about each individual E sub P, but we need to have some hypotheses on the weights of uh, W minus one. Okay. Now, like I said, I'm going to say that the unipotent radical is large if it's equal to W minus one and M. And there are cases where it, you can see when it has, this happens, for example, if M has two weights, let's say it's an extension of one by, by L, where L is of pure weight um, less than zero. So this has weight zero. Um, in that case, end, uh, the endomorphism, the motive which you get, but end M, in other words, M tensor M dual has weight zero plus minus P, and therefore W minus one of end M is just L. And so to say that the, the U of M is large means it's L uh, or zero, and because this thing is L, uh, and because L is a simple object, that it doesn't have subobjects, so it's either L if M is not simple or zero if M is simple. So therefore, the unipotent radical is large. In this context, it's large when M is not semi-simple. Okay. Now, Deline and Goncharov also compute uh, extensions of mixed state motives um, uh, in the following way: when by of one by Q of n. There, there is no non-trivial extension for n even, but for n odd, the, the space is exactly one dimensional. So there's a unique class of an extension. So in particular, if I choose three here, there's a unique extension uh, of this kind. And since these state motives are simple, it means that the unipotent radical of the, of the Galois group for M must be all of Q of three. This is a non-split by what I just, this example that I just explained here. Okay, and moreover, the Mumford Tate group itself is two dimensional because the semi simple part of it is actually one dimensional and the unipotent radical is one dimensional. So this is two dimensional. And the periods associated by the calculation I, should, I mentioned earlier of the Lin Contrarov involves pi and zeta three. So in this case, the period conjecture is again that zeta three and pi are algebraically independent. Okay. Um, what we do is um, we, we develop some criteria by which you're able to inductively say that unipotent radicals of mixed motives are large using again, weight disjointedness conditions. Okay, let's skip this for now. And so I can get to the actual construction. So what we do now to construct a mo one motive that, the, a motive that has zeta three log two and pi is we use a construction of growth in D called extension panache it appears in SGA seven. And it's a way of patching together extensions. So what he says is suppose I have an extension of A by B that looks like this and an extension of C by A that looks like this. Then uh, a mixed um, uh, extension or patched together extension is one where an object M that fits into this, this kind of sequence. So I create, I use this one and I repeat B and here I use, uh, I repeat C and I use L, something that fits into a sequence of this kind. So I start with an extension of A by B and an extension of C by A and I construct, I try to, I try to construct an extension that look, looks like this. And Grothendieck shows that uh, such a thing exists um, if X2 of C by B is zero and it's unique if X1 C by B is zero. Okay, so the motives I choose here are, I remember I had a mo an extension by Dillon Goncharov of Q of three M 
and one. So I take I do a take twist of that. So then I get Q of four, M of one, Q of one. And then vertically, I take something called the Kumar motive, which is certain one motive. And now um, I can assert that this extension panache exists, namely because everything I'm using are Tate motives and in the category of Tate motives, X2 is zero, again, by Dylan Gantara. And um, also by the theorem of uh, Boral Wojewodski that I quoted before, extension of one Q of four is zero, remember? So therefore, um, the, the MR exists and is unique. So this gives me a construction of a motive M sub R. And now we can ask what, what is the nature of this M sub R? And we find out that um, it has um, a large unipotent part by take P equals to, I apply the theorem that I, I went through, I sort of skipped here, this theorem that allows me to, uh, gives me a criterion for saying when the unipotent radical of M is large by working with a piece of the weight filtration and the quotient. I do that with P equals two and uh, P equals minus two rather. And using that, we deduce that the, the unipotent radical of MR is large. Um, now the graded of MR, as you can see, is going to have this and this and this. So it's three dimensional, there it is. And the unipotent radical is W minus one of NMR. You can write down what the weights are and you'll find that there's exactly- yeah, Just uh, a question, yeah. uh, uh, under what conditions is that an extension always a motive? Is, is there some sort of a criteria like that? Yeah, this is extension. I mean, these extensions are in the category of, mi of, of state, mixed state motives. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. Fine. Fine. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. therefore the unipotent radical in this case has dimension three. Um, and so the full Mumford Tate group, uh, the, the semi-simple part is one dimensional, will have dimension four. So that means the periods of these, uh, whatever they are, are uh, so this is as big as it can get. So the periods therefore have to be algebraically independent. Now we know three of the periods. We know two pi i to the minus four is there. We know zeta of three is there. And we know I, I, I took r equals two, but I can take actually any log r here. Um, log two is a period and there is a fourth period. We don't know yet how to compute that, but all four of those have to be algebraically independent according to growth index conjecture. And so far we need a, we don't know how to compute this. I, I don't think it's going to be possible to get a geometric realization. We need to under, just understand this a little better. So that's, uh, that's basically what I wanted to say that um, there's a kind of um, Euler dare to dream big trying to connect this really mysterious number zeta of three with things that um, we already know about log two and pi. Um, the dream is worth a, worthy of being a dream. It's uh, given rise to a lot of mathematics and we're not done yet. But then there's the other dream of growth indeed about the uh, period conjecture which suggests that these are actually all, all pointing in different directions um, and that they are algebraically independent. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot for that extremely beautiful lecture. Any questions, comments from people? Yeah, I had one. What was the weight disjointedness condition that you had uh, with Payman? Yeah, let's see, I'll show you. Um, that's a little technical, but let me see if I can. Uh, okay, then maybe you can tell me later, that's okay. Yeah, sure, sure. So, um, uh, it occurs in a simple form here. Uh, let's see. Here, you see that I wanted lots of distinct weights. So I want the one-dimensional pieces to sort of stay apart. I don't want I don't want mixing between the piece the uh, pure pieces. So I want lots of distinct pieces. It's something like that. And then in the in the next theorem, it becomes more complicated. Um, this this one here that same thing becomes a little bit more complicated. I, I, I can, as I said, I'll share it with you. With, uh, separate okay, questions. thanks. Uh, yeah. yeah. I'll talk to you later about it. Sure, sure. And by the way, the preprint is available. It's posted and I, if somebody wants, I can give you the link. It's, I think Payman put it on his website. So it's available. Okay, I'll look. And, okay. <laughs> Any other questions?
Uh, sir, I have a question. Uh, actually, uh, in the in, in the starting of the lecture, uh, Professor Murthy mentioned about uh, there are some research going in magic, uh, where uh, people are trying to find out the impact of mathematics in real world. So, uh, can you elaborate something about that? Uh, how is actually mathematics impacting uh, the real world? Yeah. So first, I, I'm happy to talk about that because I'm quite passionate about it. It's a big initiative of the, of the Institute, but I just want to correct you gently on one thing. It's not about the real world. I don't even know what the real world is. It's not, we don't live in a phony world when we do math. When, we, when we're talking about the Riemann zeta function, it's not a phony world. It's a, it, I don't know what, when we say what is real and what is not real. So if you're talking about the, the physical world, um, Take, for example, diabetes. It's a really interesting project that started. Uh, I remember 10 years ago, when I was, uh, maybe more than, longer than that, when I was chair of the math department, I used to have to convince people outside of mathematics about the importance of, of math. Times have changed. They're coming to us and saying they need math, math at the table. So diabetes, uh, researchers in diabetes have come to us and said that they, they want a partnership. Uh, they want to know, can mathematics help? Here's the big problem in diabetes. That if, you, if you make a dent in this problem, you're going to change the world. So type two diabetes, the problem is we don't know why it is that, that for some people, it, you just live with it, you manage it all your life. Some people, it becomes a really serious matter. You know, it might lead to blindness, might lead to amputation, and lead to, that becomes really. Can we tell early on that some complication is, is likely to result? That's the question they were asking. And we are now applying, believe it or not, a little bit of number theory and a little bit of algebraic topology to try to answer that question. All right. Is it something to do with the genome sequence? No, is it not? So here's another thing. Where, no, if, if we don't know the, we don't know the, um, we don't know the, the genetic, um, uh, we the might principle. get, so actually maybe it's, uh, let me say it like this. By the time it comes to, the, to us, it's a data cloud and we're agnostic to where that data cloud came from. So it embedded in it might in fact be genetic information. But we are looking for topological and arithmetic properties of that cloud. And we're trying to, we're trying to, actually we're looking at, here, now we have formulated as an abstract problem. I give you, and this is, should be of interest to anybody who's studying data science. I give you two data clouds, okay? Cloud A and cloud B, and maybe they're even complementary. And I give you an incomplete vector and ask which of these clouds is it likely to belong to? That's the question. So we have, I, I picked diabetes because there's a ton of really rich data all over the world. People have been gathering data, really, really rich databases of, uh, uh, give you track a person's history, you know, from, from early on. So the, the data is really rich. And now, um, but these kind of problems about comparing data clouds doesn't seem to have occur occurred so far. At least I've not seen it in the literature. And when we're, as I said, introducing a little bit of number theory into it too. So that's a problem that magic is, is going to consider. Uh, magic is already active in uh, using mathematics for public health. We got in fact major funding for that. Um, so we are, uh, we are amongst the people who are, uh, I'm sure many of you in India are doing that as well, but in, in Canada, we are um, providing in, you know, predictions and information about how the pandemic might unfold um, using mathematical methods. So uh, the other, and so those, those are the kind of themes that we're doing. And, and, and my point about what I said at the beginning about don't make such a hard distinction between pure and applied research is, it can flow the other way too. As we work on these things, we will discover new things that, that not be a priori connected to applications, but they're just really interesting problems. Yeah. Yeah. Laurish has, uh, yeah. has a question. Yeah. 
Professor Moti, your question sounds like uh, you're approaching uh, what we typically known as a topological data analysis. Is that the approach that are you taking for the diabetes problem? Partly, we're starting there. Okay. We're starting so, there, but we're in, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so this problem that uh, what you were suggesting, whether the two cloud and a particular case belongs to cloud one or cloud two, sounds to me a testing of hypothesis problem in topological data. So there are certain papers came out recently. So, oh. and we do offer a course on topological data analysis in CMI. Um, so that's why I got into this. So yeah, sounds it like, sounds like, sounds like a good thing to collaborate on them. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Yeah. Good. Sure. Yeah. So also another question I have, um, so uh, as far as as I understand that the language of uh, brain is quite a lot complicated. So how mass is helping uh, helping to understand that? Oh come on! Nobody's asking me about motives. Okay, <laughs> language of, language of the brain, language of the brain. I'll tell you. Uh, all I know about it is what von Neumann said. Um, one Neumann wrote a little book, many, many of you I'm sure I'm familiar with it, it's called The Computer in the Brain. And he wrote it in the 50s. You know, one Neumann was, um, if you've been to Princeton, you, there's a building called the ECP building, uh, the Electronic Computer Project. <laughs> so that whole building was one computer. So computers were just you know, very crude things at that time. And, and yet he dared at that point to analyze the, what is the, difference or a similarity between the computer and the brain. And he came to various conclusions to, we don't have time to, to elaborate on that, but um, he asked at the very end, what is the language of the brain? And he made a kind of speculation that mathematics is a derivative of the language of the brain. And that the language of the brain is stochastic not positional, information is not represented in a positional form, but in a stochastic form. And he didn't elaborate. And those lectures were, I think the last ones he gave, he died soon after that. I don't, I'm not talking to neuroscientists and saying, what, what is this all about? And what, what can we say? I mean, if it, if it is the stochasticity, stochastic patterns of firing of neurons that is conveying information, then um, can we read it? Naturally, if you can read firing of neurons, you know how, what, what implications that has. That, that, that completely changes a lot of, lot of things about people who are not able to express themselves in any other way. So I'm just taking my cue from von Neumann and asking what, what, is, what is the implication of a question like that? You know, it's really it's a starting point of a conversation. So I'll tell you uh, that this is true in mathematics itself, but, but it happens beyond mathematics too. The biggest impediment to discovery is not understanding the language. The biggest impediment to discovery is not understanding the language. For example, let's say just even in what I spoke about right now, suppose you're very comfortable with one or other of those fears. You know, you love the Riemann zeta function, but you, don't, you hate motives. Or you, love, or you love motives, but you don't like the Riemann zeta function. Then this kind of question is not possible. So in magic, my goal is in the first instance to bring people together and learn to talk to each other. So for language of the brain, we have people from the, the neuroscience, we have a whole university health network. So there's a big group, in Mount Sinai Hospital. Um, it turns out the astrophysicists are also interested in this. So we have a three-way partnership with the uh, Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics, Mount Sinai Hospital and the uh, Fields Institute uh, thinking about the language of the brain. And, and if you ask any of us, what, what are we doing? We say, we don't know. I don't know yet. <laughs> We're just ta learning to talk to each other. I remember we talked about it 15 years ago, 10 years ago, <laughs> yeah. five years ago, right. many times, right. <laughs> often, right. often for an hour or so. Yeah. Yeah. So Pramath and I have had long chats about this when he has visited Toronto. 
Um, and I think for different reasons, maybe we're both in, interested in, in understanding this more. But, but you see how, how rich mathematics is, that uh, it, it goes, it has a huge role to play in many of the fundamental problems of the world. So, so we shouldn't do us, ourselves a disservice by limiting it to where, where we see it and how we engage with it. it. It's much broader than that. But the five things I said at the beginning, I can give you one hour talk or long, longer talks on each one of those topics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's lots to say on that. And, and I think, but, it, but because it represents such a huge opportunity. So, thanks. That's a, so, if, are there further questions? Madhavan, how long can this session go? I mean, if Kumar is there, I think people are good. <laughs> yeah, as long as he's willing to go, we can go. But I think that I don't see any further questions at the moment. As, uh, I mean, the, uh, as far as the motives part is concerned, I need to understand the lecture a little better. <laughs> so, it'll come as private questions. <laughs> okay, sure, sure. Yeah, sure. So, there are no further questions. I wish to thank Kumar Murthy for a really wonderful talk. I mean, I'm, at, the, at a very philosophical level, I saw the beauty of the whole thing. In terms of mathematical details, I need to know understand better. The two, I mean, there, there are lots of issues there. <laughs> okay, so as as always, first rate exposition, and so pleasure to thank you again for this session, and we hope to involve you even more in the future activities of the police center. Yeah, I'd be interested in that. Thank you. 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 Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.